Today is November, Wednesday, November 4th. We are in the Glenview Public Library. Um, people in the work room are Mr. Robert Emerson, Ms. Mary Weed, Mr. Dan Rhodes, David Sulk, and myself, Amy Basla. Um, what's your birth date, Mr. Emerson? On November 16, 1945. Okay, and what organization were you working with? In what regard? Um, in your national service. Oh, uh, United States Army. And um, what rank did you have in the Army? Um, I entered as a private. I was drafted as a private. Okay. And I came out as a captain. Okay. Um, what type of work did you perform? Um, the first year I was in the Army, I went through training. So I went through basic uh, training, advanced individual training, and then officer candidate school. And I graduated from Officer Candidate School 23 May 1969 as a second lieutenant in the infantry in the United States Army. From there, I was transferred to Berlin, West Berlin, Germany. Uh, and the wall was still up in 1969. And I spent about 16 months in West Berlin. And from there, I was transferred to South Vietnam. And I arrived in, in country in South Vietnam in January of 1971, and I departed South Vietnam in December of 1971, and came back to the United States and was uh, relieved from active duty in February of 72, and main, stayed in the reserves until March of 78, and uh, was relieved from the Army in March of 78. So I spent about 10 years in the Army. Um, so you mentioned that you were drafted. Can you tell me about that? I was. I graduated from Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon in, Ju in May of 1968. Came home to a draft notice. Went and took my draft physical, which I passed, which shocked me, because I was uh, thin to be polite. And I have a heart murmur from birth. Neither one seemed to bother the Army. Uh, joined the Army in June of 68, as I said, and uh, volunteered for OCS, and uh, then the rest I've all already re repeated to you. Okay. Um, can you, t like, do you remember your first days of service, what your first impressions were? Um, I, I, I remember them very well. They were... I went from Chicago to Fort Dix, New Jersey, where, where we went through what's called basically entry. And you spend about 10 days uh, getting uniforms and uh, getting your hair cut and, you know, that kind of stuff. And Fort Dix was full for basic training, so they sent us on to um, Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic training. Uh, normally you stay at one post the whole time. You're in training, except maybe when you go into something like officer candidate school. But the group I was in went to Fort Dix for entry, then Fort Knox in Kentucky for basic training, then Fort Polk, Louisiana after the first nine months for advanced individual training, and then to Fort Benning, Georgia for a year, uh, half a year of officer candidate school. Okay. Um, can you tell me about boot camp or basic training and how that went for you? Um, basically, boot camp or basic training Advanced individual training and officer candidate school are always tr all trying to do the same thing. Instead of you thinking of yourself first, they're trying to get you, you to think of the group first. And that took at least uh, eight months for the group that I was with. And we were all down in, in Fort Benning, Georgia, in theory, learning to become officers. Um, and we were out doing what's called grass drill, which is just as many calisthenics as you can possibly do. You run down to the end of wherever you are, and you do as many push-ups as you can do. Then you run back to where you were, and you do as many sit-ups as you can do. And then you keep doing whatever they tell you to do, as long as you can do it. And after we'd done this for about an hour, and everybody was still doing it, nobody dropped out, uh, they told us to run down to a grandstand, which was maybe 100 meters away, roughly 100 yards. and come back. And the first three guys that cross the finish line don't have to do grass drill anymore. And that was important because when we got down there as a group, and I'd like to say I thought of this, but I didn't, somebody said, 
let's cross the finish line online, which means you cross as one, okay? Which is the way they're trying to get you to think. And we did that, and of course the TAC officers, tactical officers, who are the guys there telling you what to do, <clears throat> they were all very pleased with what we did, though they didn't show it and they didn't say it. They all put us back down for a thousand more push-ups or a thousand sit-ups or a combination of the two. But that's, that's the whole purpose of military training, um, is to think about this group before I think about myself. And that takes a long time to do. Um, and it, it was, every time I think about it, I just smile now. Because it's such a difference in point of view. So do you think that your mindset changed after? Did you like, feel that there was a big difference? I don't know if there's a big difference, but yeah, the mindset changes and you see it in all of the people you're with. Uh, and occasionally you go back to the way you used to think. I mean, it doesn't, you know, nothing is permanent and forever. Mm -hmm. But you can see the basic change occurring and as time goes on, it expands. You, you become more group-centered and less personally centered. And it's, um, it's sort of refreshing. So you said um, that you went to Berlin. Can you tell me about your experience there? Berlin is, um, Berlin then was in East Germany. Now Germany is united. But this is a map of Berlin, this being East Berlin, this being West Berlin, the French sector being in the north, the British sector being in the central, and the American sector being in the south. And this is basically a place of show and parades. And so you're in, yet you're in uniform all the time, but you're either practicing for a parade or you're getting past the last parade you just went through. <clears throat> and it's, um, it's very straight-laced, it's very formal. Um, you could visit into East Berlin, but you had to do it in uniform. And I did that uh, once. And my wife and I went into a shop. And I'm in, I'm in what are called Class A's, a green military uniform, looks like a suit, except you wear a funny hat. And I'm talking to the owner of the store. And all of a sudden I heard the door open behind me, and I had never had this experience before. I'm looking at the owner of the store, and it's as though you pulled a window shade down over his face. He went expressionless. I didn't have to look around to see who walked in. It was the uh, local East Berlin police, um, or East, uh, East German Army, which <clears throat> is a whole other story. But I then stopped talking to him, went over with my wife, looked at the stuff on the shelves, and then we walked out after about two minutes, because I didn't want to rush out like we were planning something evil. Um, I just wanted to be very formal about it and very regular about it because I don't want to cause the shop owner any problem. And to take this to a slightly finer point, in East Berlin, television antennas were monitored, home television antennas were monitored by this, uh, the police. So if they're pointed towards the East German television station, that's okay. But if they're pointed towards the West Berlin television station, that can get the parents thrown in jail. That's how overall the coverage was in Berlin. Because this is West Berlin, and this is, this is like Chicago. I mean, there are department stores, and there's transportation, and people are all busy going around and doing all kinds of stuff. And this was the antithesis of that. This was, um, the atmosphere was 100% opposite. It was very stilted. It was very stratified. You did what you did. You went to work. You went home. You ate dinner, and you know, <clears throat> and you didn't um, watch West Berlin uh, television stations, which I find astounding, but it's true. Um, can you? So you mentioned that you had your wife with you. Yes. Was she there with you the whole time? Yes. And so, were you able to just live in housing that was provided by? The housing, the housing was provided by the U.S. government, so um, I lost my $110 a month housing allowance, but I got a two-bedroom apartment <coughs> um, for, for, at no charge in, in the American housing area, um, which in Berlin, like Chicago, in 1969, uh, house, that apartment would have cost me $1,000 a month. 
<clears throat> but it was provided because when I was there, I was part of occupation from World War II. I have an occupation medal on my uniform, <clears throat> ribbon, uh, from World War II because in 1969, when this was occupied by the Soviets, French, British, and the Americans, it was occupied from World War II <coughs> continuously, which is um, a little hard to get used to. But for example, if you were a civilian and you were crossing from West Berlin at the checkpoint into East Germany to go to West Germany, it would take you a minimum of two hours to clear the East German checkpoint because you had six stations to go through. It took me 15 minutes and I had this, which is called a flag order, and it's in Russian, French, and English, and it allows me to go through a Russian checkpoint. <clears throat> and they basically look at my identification, and I'm back in the road. Whereas German civilians, or any civilians, American, whoever, that are not military, have to go through the East German checkpoint. And that takes two hours between West Berlin and East Germany. And then when you get to Helmstedt, which was the crossing point, one of the crossing points into West Germany, it takes you another two hours minimum to go through the same six checkpoints. And if they get upset, for whatever reason, I have, it, sometimes it took all day. That didn't happen very often. But one time when I went through the Russian side, the traffic was backed up for a half mile to a mile. So it was very, very political in atmosphere between here and here, east and west, and between here, west, and east Germany. This is east Berlin, west Berlin. This is west Berlin, east Germany. East Germany, all the way around. Um, so what were you, like, what were your jobs there while you were in Berlin? What were you doing? I had, I had three jobs. Yeah, just three. <laughs> <coughs> I was uh, a uh, platoon leader. There are 43 guys in a platoon. I'm the lieutenant, and, and, and the other 42 are uh, platoon sergeant, uh, four squad leaders, and there's <clears throat> nine men in addition to the squad leader in each squad. Hopefully that comes to uh, 42 or 43 or whatever. <clears throat> so that was my first job, and that took six months. Then I was the battalion intelligence officer for the second six months. And then I became the Army Community Services Officer at Berlin Brigade Headquarters <clears throat> and I was responsible for, amongst other things, 143 waiting wives whose husbands were in Vietnam. And the, ver the most difficult task I had in my entire military service was informing a, a, a waiting wife that her husband had been killed in, in Vietnam. Um, can you tell me about like, how did you go about doing that? Oh, um, she came into the office on a Wednesday because she'd been advised by the Department of Defense in Washington by telephone that her husband was missing in action. And so she came into my office because I'm responsible for, if she has any difficulties at all, she comes and sees me and I get them straightened out. So I called Landschul, Germany, which is a major medical center. They called Department of Defense. They had no more information on her husband. That was on Wednesday. 2.30 in the morning on Friday, the following Friday, uh, the word comes in from Department of Defense that he's been killed in action. We had a policy against waking people up to give them bad news. So when I got into the office at 7.30 in the morning on Friday, I was informed of the news. And then I called the chaplain, and I made arrangements to uh, get a staff card. And I went and picked up the chaplain, and then we went out to her house. Now, she had already been in my office, so she knew my face. <clears throat> so when she sees my face at her front door and a chaplain, she knows we don't have to tell her anything. But you've got a telegram, you've got to read it, you've got to make sure there's somebody else with her. You cannot leave by regulation. You cannot leave the spouse by themselves, male or female. And so you make sure there's somebody with them, and then you have a follow-up officer um, or a non-commissioned officer that uh, is her liaison. So if she has any questions at all, about the support she's supposed to get. Is she getting the right thing? Is somebody telling her the truth? She calls just one person. 
and all questions are answered by that person. And I was not the liaison that I delivered the message, but I wasn't a liaison because I was on orders to Vietnam. And it seemed to me sort of silly to tell her three weeks from then that I was leaving and she was going to get somebody new. So we got somebody else appointed right away to be her support functionary. Did you um, ever find out how her husband got killed? No. It's, um, I don't know that they knew, but it's not a question, when you deliver, it's not, it's not a question that I've ever heard asked by the family. Um, eventually that information comes, usually, but they might ask it six months later or maybe a year later. And, and their liaison is the liaison for as long as they need it, which is another reason that I would be a silly liaison because I was gone for six weeks or so. Um, is there anything else about Berlin that stands out? Um, no, other than it's a unique city, and if people can go, they should, because it's much like Chicago. But if you go, um, there's lots to see. But go and find out what you want to see, because like Chicago, there's lots of stuff here that won't interest you. So you should find out what's available that you want to see, and then go and have a great time. It's a neat town. Was, was it tense while you were there, though, or no? Um, after, after a while, you're used to it, so it's not tense. But occasionally, you'd see a green flare pop up along the wall. And that could be from, from a, a dog or a cat or something. It wasn't necessarily an escape attempt. But that would cause some tension. Um, oops. Um, Berlin is here. Here's Hanover. So it's in the north, generally speaking. And um, <clears throat> this, it just shows you that the dividing line is right here. So it's sort of deep. Okay. Thank you. It will. Um, yes. OK, so um, it looks like there were a couple of months in between being in Berlin and Vietnam? Oh, yeah. When I transferred to Berlin, transferred from Berlin to Vietnam, I went through Fort Bragg, North Carolina, <clears throat> where I went through language and cultural training because I was going to be a military advisor in Vietnam for what turned out to be the popular forces. Um, language and culture training is in Vietnam, in the United States. If I want you to come towards me, I go like this. That's rude in the Orient. That's rude in Asia. You go like this. Okay. Um, the other thing it's very important to learn is that the Vietnamese language, uh, the word ban, if I drop the inflection at the end, it means one thing. If I raise the inflection, it means a different thing. And the difference is friend and shoot. That's not a mistake you want to make. So I had an interpreter with me everywhere I went. And that way I prevented myself from making a silly mistake. Sergeant Tong, Chung Shik Tong was his name. And he's pictured right there. Um, in any case, he, uh, he's, he was critical to the mission. See, I start talking funny already. Um, what I did was, I was in Baswin province, which is in South Vietnam, thank you, uh, below what we call Saigon, what we call Saigon is now Ho Chi Minh City, down in the Mekong Delta. And the popular forces were out on ambushes every night. Okay, But just like in, in school, if you are studying the same subject all the time and you study it the exact same way, sometimes you miss something or you forget to do something because you get, you wouldn't, but some people get careless. So I put them through a training program called Night Operations, Night Ambushes, and trained the trainers so that now they're going to clean the glass the way they're supposed to 
instead of the way we all clean the glass if we've been cleaning it for five years because you get tired of doing it the way you know that person back in the classroom told you to do it. <clears throat> but some things are good to brush up on. So I, I, I re-brushed them up on their night ambush skills and sent them back out to train the people in the districts in Baswin province, which is south of the this branch of the Mekong, the southernmost branch of the Mekong Delta, in the Mekong Delta. <clears throat> and they went out and got the people, in theory, to uh, refurbish their skills. And I'll give you an example. We had some people in province who went out to cut palmetto. That's the leaves and branches that are used to make roofs on huts in Vietnam. And they went out the same route every day for five days in a row. That's verboten. That's a no-no. And on the fifth day, whoever my counterpart was in the Viet Cong, who trained the Viet Cong in ambush activities, I don't know what took him so long, but on the fifth day, he finally ambushed these guys going out to cut palmetto. Um, I'm surprised he didn't do it on the third day. But <clears throat> at any rate, so there's some things you cannot do. And the, and the example of taking the same path out in and out every day is an example of laziness. It's the easy thing to do. I don't want to, then you got to walk through them. But, and it wasn't a very effective ambush because there were like uh, six people and only three of them got killed. I mean, they should have gotten all six. At any rate, that's, but that's the reason you, and we all need to do it, whatever skill set we have, whether it's studying or working or whatever, we need to refurbish our skills periodically because we can get sloppy. And when I say we, I mean all of us. Okay. Um, so you said you were an advisor. So is that the main thing that you were doing, just helping people brush up on like skills that they needed to have? Exactly. Okay. And then, um, so what were your impressions of the Vietnamese, like the people as well as their like Viet Cong? Um, the Vietnamese people are all the same. That is to say, they all have, they're not all from the same culture. It's, um, they're, they're all, like, like this map shows, around all of Southeast Asia, there are lots of different large cultural groups. Within the large cultural groups, there are smaller cultural groups, just like there are here in the United States. And the people are, it's like some, Cubs fans like other Cubs fans. Some Cubs fans don't like other Cubs fans. And, and then some White Sox fans get along with Cubs fans, and then some White Sox fans don't. But it's like that kind of thing. And you kind of, when you're first there, you get an assessment in your own head about who's who in the zoo, and who's up here, and who's down here, <clears throat> and who gets along with who. And you, because you don't want to offend anybody. And I'll give you an example. I was asked to go to a Buddhist celebration. And across from me, across the table from me, is the chief Buddhist priest in the region. Don't ask me why I was invited. Don't ask me why I sat across from him. I don't know. But when, when my counterpart, the guy I'm in, in theory advising, puts some food in my plate, I have to eat it. I don't want to ask what it is. I think I know what it is. I don't want to, know. I don't want to ask what it is, though. And I eat it to be polite. If it's in your plate, it's not like you eat part of it. You eat all of it. Especially when you're sitting across from the chief Buddhist priest. Whether it's you or me or anybody else. So one of the reasons I didn't ask is because I'm a bit of a finicky eater. And what I don't know won't hurt me. <laughs> <clears throat> Out of self-defense. Because this is, this is no place for, you know, a scene. Um, so I ate the food. And I got through it. And I still don't know what it is. Well, I'm pretty sure what it is today, but I still don't know technically what it is. But that's very different than I would be in the United States. Um, and very different way to act. But I like breathing. And it's not that the Buddhist priest is going to kill me, or any of these people are going to kill me, because they're all on my side. But if I offend these people, then maybe they won't be as defensively oriented in my interest or offensively oriented towards the enemy 
a as they might be. So my job is to secure their friendship, to do my job, and get home in one piece. The last thing being the biggest objective. Um, so you were talking about your food. What other kinds of foods did you have there in Vietnam? Well, in my location where I was stationed, we had regular food like, you know, like you guys had back in the United States, like we have here in the United States. <laughs> <clears throat> it's amazing how easy it is to slip back into things. Um, but, uh, you know, you, I mean, you could have a ham sandwich, you could have uh, meatloaf, you could have whatever. It might be heated, it might not be, depending on where you were and the situation, and you might have sea rations. But it's all edible. If you get hungry enough, you'd be surprised what you can eat. At a formal Buddhist celebration, um, then it's probably rice, uh, maybe some, pot, uh, what I would think of as pasta, uh, <clears throat> and some meat. Okay, but one of the reasons that um, we had two American casualties in province while I was, one while I was there, uh, another shortly after I left. The reason we only had two casualties in a whole year um, is because the province in peacetime grew 600,000 metric tons of rice. In peacetime it grew 450,000 metric tons of rice. And rice is too important for everybody to mess around with. So the bad guys, that depends on which side of the fence you're on as to who the bad guys are. Um, the bad guys didn't mess with rice. We didn't mess with rice. <clears throat> and occasionally, people went out on operations and said hello to the bad guys, and the bad guys said hello to us. That's a euphemistic way of saying there was contact periodically with the enemy but not like there was in central and north Viet, uh, central and north south vietnam if that makes any sense <clears throat> so i should say my province was the third quietest province in country there was one province with no enemy activity the viet cong had killed a buddhist priest and the and the local people said stuff it get out Viet Cong killed a couple more people, and they said, we don't care. Leave. So they left. Then there was one uh, province below us in activity, and then there was our province. So we were at the south end of activity. South end of the country, south end of activity. So would Ru you, uh, no, sorry. No, rice is a wonderful thing. Okay, so rice is, you really think that's the main reason that it well, it certainly wasn't me. <laughs> um, yeah, rice is the only thing that makes any sense. I mean, people could walk around all day and say it was me, you know, but John Wayne, I ain't, and rice is too important to everybody to mess with. Um, so, for when you were in Vietnam there, were, did you keep, was your family with you still then? Or like they were in Berlin, or no? Uh, my wife was back in California with her family, oh, okay. and um, my parents were in uh, Winnetka, which is where they lived. Um, no, uh, you can't. The, we in one district in the province, we did have a civilian, and his wife visited him for a week, but she didn't stay, so it was not. It was quiet enough to have civilians there, but the military, I wasn't of sufficient rank to have a, uh, some senior officers had wives in the Philippines, and they could fly back monthly and see their wife. Um, my wife was in California, and I got to meet her in Hawaii for two weeks in August, for the year I was there. Um, so, but were you able to stay in touch with them? Well, yeah, via letters. Um, but we didn't have, uh, well, obviously it's 1969, 70, 71, uh, 1971 actually. So there was no internet, there was no uh, telephone service. Um, there might have been telephone service from Saigon, maybe from the hospital in Kanta. 
<clears throat> which was the headquarters for Military Region 4. Um, but there wasn't any telephone service from where I was at. So it's all letter writing. And it takes about, a, and you don't, best part is you don't pay for stamps. You just sign your name. And uh, then the military postal system takes care of it. <clears throat> Um, I'd rather pay for stamps than be back in the States. <laughs> so what um, things stood out to you most, like what experiences stood out to you most while you were in Vietnam? Um, the thing that stands out the most is looking forward to waking up the next day, every day. If you're out in an operation at night, staying awake all night long, making sure you come in from the operation alive and preferably not wounded um, and getting out successfully, coming back home unscathed, as unscathed as possible. Some things, I don't react well to unexpected loud noises, so if the fire alarm went off in the, in the library right now, um, I would say some things that you might want to remove from the video. Um, if I'm driving next to a truck, as I was on Skokie Highway, next to Old Orchard, and it backfired, um, I wouldn't want to repeat what I said in my vehicle, uh, but there was nobody with me, so nobody else knows. But other than that, I'm relatively unscathed. Um. So, uh, is there anything else that you... I might tell you one quick story. Um, when I was in officer candidate school, we were at a firing range. We were there all day. And we were going to stay there for night fire. And so we had dinner between day fire and night fire. And this is the part you won't believe. Somebody brought a guitar. And we had a guitar. And all of us sang anti-war songs around a fire while we ate dinner and then we went out to night fire. This is why we're in trained to become infantry officers. You had to be you had to be there in 1969 to fully appreciate um, it's like where have all the flowers gone or something like that um, and but it happened. Um, so we were uh, we were the most decorated unit that went through Fort Benning at the time. One of the most decorated units ever. Why, I don't know, because we were all regular folks. But we were all college graduates, too. Mm -hmm. And um, that may make a difference. And so how, was, how did you feel about the war? Like, and how did you think that most of your class, while being in college, felt like how did <coughs> Um, probably most of the people in, in, in college were against it. I didn't feel one way about it or the other, and I debated it in college um, because I was 5'8 and 117 and a half pounds. They weren't going to draft me. They weren't going to take me in service. I was safe. And I don't mean to appear completely foolish about it, but I mean, I, so I wasn't concerned. And they did draft me because they need people, and it's funny how expansive the open arm policy can be when they need people, as opposed to how critical the choices become when they are uh, they have more people than they need. Um, if you, that makes any sense. Do you uh, so tell us how you, you, like how you got home from Vietnam? Oh, um, I had my wisdom teeth out in November too, and everything was fine. Woke up the next day, went to work, everything was fine. So I had the second two out in December and woke up the next day and everything was fine. Had it out on a Friday, went to work on Saturday, woke up Sunday morning with a blood spot on my pillow. <clears throat> um, by Tuesday, the medic was bringing me chicken soup, otherwise known as uh, penicillin. Um, and I went up to the hospital on Tuesday and I had lost although this is hard for me to believe, but it's, that's what they told me. I had lost half the blood in my body. So um, they evacuated me to Saigon on the 24th of December, 1971. They evacuated me to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. And on 25 December, 1971, um, we were supposed to fly, and I say we, it was a whole plane, 
uh, of people who were supposed to fly to Hickam and in Hawaii and uh, on to uh, Oakland, California. And the plane couldn't close its back door, silly as that sounds. So we took off at 3.30 in the afternoon, Christmas Day, landed at Hickam Air Force Base, 5.30 in the morning, 25 December 1971, best Christmas day I ever had in my whole life. A um, little short on blood. Flew on to Oakland, flew on to Letterman General Hospital in San Francisco, and spent the next 30 days there. And every day they came in and took blood from me, and I looked at the tech one time and I said, I'm here because I'm short of blood, right? And the guy said, yeah. And I said, you take blood from me every day, right? He said, yeah. I said, do you, are you, you know, when do I get some back? He said, no, we don't give any back, we just take it. <laughs> <clears throat> but everything worked out, and um, I'm standing here before you. All right, so after um, you left the service, what did you do? What profession did you do? What oh, I, um, I went into sales, and then I tried law school, and I found out that I didn't want to be an attorney. Um, and I went back to sales, and I spent uh, my entire working career in sales and marketing uh, for 30 years. Um, so how did your experiences with the Army affect like, where you are today and what you've done, like what you did with the rest of your life? Um, I think I look at people differently. I don't, I, if I'm putting a group together to do a job, I don't care who is the most senior person. I don't care who is the most intelligent person. I want to know who has the best capabilities in what areas and apply those capabilities in the areas that relate to the project we're doing. Okay? Whether they're men or women, whether they're whatever, doesn't matter to me. That's what I learned in the military. Um, take advantage of everybody's best capabilities, traits, whatever you want to call them, and let them do the job and then get the group together and it, the person that's in charge of the group, whoever that might be, can take credit for it at the end, but get the job done as effectively as possible, as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, effectively and efficiently, and then worry about, you know, where the, the congratulations fall later. Um, <clears throat> and invariably, people will get to know each other better, appreciate each other more, and there will be none of this they're one of those kind of things, you know, like there'll be no chauvinism in theory because I will fully appreciate your capabilities and you will fully appreciate mine and theirs and we'll all accomplish the task more effectively and efficiently than if we did it otherwise. And there used to be, there still is in some places, prejudices because of people's ethnic origin, because of their uh, Whatever. And, and, and that strikes me as silly. That's what I learned in the Army. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add? No. Right. Um, I applaud your questions. I thought you did it. I thought they were excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.